United we are strong as a mountain. Our next speaker is Frank Hammer. Frank is a retired union leader of UAW 909 and a longtime international activist in Colombia and for workers around the world. His brother worked for the AIFLD and was assassinated in El Salvador. He has been in a long struggle to find out what happened to his brother, who was responsible, and people being held to account for that assassination. So welcome, Frank. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. And um, I have to say that uh, this is gonna, this uh, whole ex exercise uh, that you've helped to lead uh, is gonna be extremely valuable especially with the upcoming convention of the AFL-CIO in June in Philadelphia. So I, uh, so I actually gave a name to what I'm going to say. And by the way, before I, I proceed, I just want to give a, a shout out to Rob McKenzie. I know that he's no longer on the call, but Kim was uh, speaking about the very, very important book that he wrote uh, in regards to the uh, machinations of the CIA an A field in Mexico at a Ford plant. And uh, he's a UAW comrade. Uh, he hails out of Minnesota, I'm um, in Detroit. Anyway, I gave a name to my, what I'm gonna say today, he who pays the piper calls the tune. So I, uh, in the first slide, I learned about my brother's assassination during the time when I was an assembly line worker at a GM plant in a suburb of Detroit. My brother, Mike, was one of three men killed by two Salvadorian National Guardsmen with semi-automatic weapons equipped with silencers as they were meeting in an empty coffee shop late at night at the Sheraton Hotel in El Salvador, San Salvador, El Salvador, January 3rd, 1981. And the first slide shows my brother on the left, Jose Rodolfo Vieira in the center and Mark Perlman on the right. So, uh, Jose Rodolfo Vieira was the Salvadorian leader of a campesino organization and the head of the government's Land Reform Institute. And uh, Perlman was uh, an A-field uh, uh, consultant. They were both connected to my brother's organization, which was the AFL-CIO's American Institute for Free Labor Development. My brother had previously been country program director in El Salvador and had recently been transferred back to the AFL-CIO headquarters in Washington, DC. As the head of the UCS, AFL's preferred campesino organization, Rodolfo Vieira worked closely with my brother. Perlman was an AFL agrarian reform consultant. Vieira was the one who called the emergency meeting at the Sheraton for which my brother made a special one day flight. So, who killed the three men? Right-wing media at the time blamed it on communists. My brother's boss, who we'll talk more about, William Doherty, didn't say it was the communists that did it. He understood that it was the right, but he blamed the communists, saying if the communists weren't doing what they did, the right wouldn't have done this either. But of course, there was a Human Rights Commission, a UN uh, Human Rights Commission, that laid out in great detail that the, there were two soldiers that were assigned the task of killing the three men with 40 rounds of machine gun fire, directed by some of the oligarchs in El Salvador, businessmen who had partial ownership in the Sheraton Hotel where they had been meeting. I want to give a little bit of background about my own family. Um, my brother and I were born of gem German parents who were refugees, who first went to Paris, and that's where my brother was born, and then went to Ecuador, which is where I was born. My brother and I ended up in LA with our dad, and after high school, he joined the US Air Force, returned to the States, attended Georgetown University School of Foreign Service because he wanted to be a career diplomat which is to say he had no association with unions, never was a member of a union, nor had he ever advocated for unions. My brother found his way into foreign service via the American Institute for Free Labor Development. 
And then you can see the second photograph is now what I'm gonna just mention that Afield got its start shortly before uh, when he before he came on and was formed in tandem with John Kennedy's Alliance for Progress in 1961, which was to be a counter-revolutionary force in response to the breakthrough liberation of Cuba in 1959. There were to be no other revolutions in the hemisphere. And I want to just re reiterate uh, Kim's remarks regarding the lock the US had on the world and especially on this hemisphere. While in the meantime, I was attending the University of California, Berkeley, joining in the 1964 free speech movement and 1965 anti-Vietnam war movements. I am understanding the class nature of US society and the role of the US ruling class, I later would decide to join with the industrial working class in the auto industry here in Detroit. Next slide. So this is from a publication published by Afield. It's a little uh, grainy, but my brother's in the picture second from the left. My brother worked for Afield as a country program director in several countries intervening in the labor movements of Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, Honduras, and in El Salvador beginning in 1966. And that's a photo from Colombia. In El Salvador, he came to lead agrarian land reform. By the late 70s, he was Afield's director of land reform for all of Latin America. William Doherty was the director of Afield and his immediate boss. And you can go to the next slide. So Doherty is the man third from the right, and my brother is the fourth from the left. Doherty's CIA credentials were exposed in the 70s by Phil, Philip Agee, a former CIA agent himself. Doherty, okay, I already mentioned that. Doherty denied that CIA money ever played a role in, the, in a field. However, my brother confided to me that there was CIA money, but only early on. Was my brother a CIA agent? It's never been verified, but there's a lot of evidence that says that he was. He was identified on, as such by the US Solicitor General in a case before the US Supreme Court in 1981 involving Philip Agee, the Solicitor General stated, the two Americans who were recently killed in El Salvador were undercover. Then there's his burial at Arlington Cemetery in Washington, DC. And here you see his headstone. Unusual to be buried as a union leader to be buried in Arlington. The qualifying explanation was that he was a US Air Force Airman First Class, which is what appears on his headstone. Next slide. Then there's the roster of dignitaries who attended his funeral. And you can see uh, in the image, the two men in the center on the left is um, part of the uh, Carter, outgoing Carter administration, Secretary of State Edmund Muskie, and to his left, Vice President Walter Mondale, and also not in the picture, was Richard Allen, soon to be national security advisor for the incoming Reagan administration. We can ask why would they be at the funeral to memorialize an AFL CIO bureaucrat? And finally, there's a, a Facebook post by my nephew, my, Mike's son, who works for the US government, where he stated that he was inspired by his father to enter into public service. That's not how you describe your father if he was a union official. All these clues certainly do verify that my brother was at least an undercover agent for the US government, working as an operative inside what was supposed to be a union organization representing US working class interests abroad. His assignment was to fulfill the counter-revolutionary objectives of a government representing the most predatory and powerful capitalist class in the, on the planet. 
His role adopting the title of union representative was a ruse. It was the only way US elites could infiltrate the working class and peasant movements of Latin America to protect their empire and their holdings, of which there are many. Keep in mind that the A field was formed, when it was formed, over 90 US captains of industry with interests in Latin America were on the board with George Meany, with capitalist Peter Grace serving as the CEO. This is the list in the next slide, actually the next four slides. These are, this is a list of all the foreign investments in El Salvador as of 1982. And it just thought, you know, glance through them and you can see some very familiar multinational corporations that had vested interests in the outcome of whatever happened in El Salvador. Okay. So for 25 years until 1987, AField hid its funding sources. The information was disclosed to mounting pressure. And this is out of a brochure that was published by AField in 87. And you can see of its $14.8 million budget, over 13 million came from the US Agency for International Development or the US AID. 1.3 million came from the institute that uh, Kim was talking about earlier, the National Endowment for Democracy. And um, the, that leaves $230,000 or 1.5% of the budget coming from the AF of L CIO. And two items about the NED, and I think I'll just adding a little bit to what, uh, what Kim already said. Uh, an article published back then pointed out that the NED board consisted of open enemies of labor, including US Republican Senator Orrin Hatch and J. Van Endel, chairman of the Amway Corporation, which is where Betsy DeVos, the education director under Trump came from. They also the NED director that Kim was mentioning earlier told the New York Times that NED was created to provide an open funding channel to foreign organizations that in the past would have been backed by the CIA. I mean, it was quite open. These are the monies the AFL CIO welcomed in the name of building an independent and free labor movement to oppose company and state controlled unions. You can't make this up. It's helpful to look at AFL's pamphlet titled the AFL-CIO's foreign policy to quote, and you can go to the next slide. Oh, it's not there. Okay, uh, well then let me just, I, I do, I, it's blank. Okay, the pamphlet says, and this was published in 87. Yeah, no, 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 go back to the blank page. The AFL CIO historically has shunned contact with the official government, officially, official government controlled labor fronts of, wait for it, the communist bloc. We recognize in the communist dominated World Federation of Trade Unions, unions are not freely, free associations of working men and women, but instruments of worker oppression. What's of particular interest in that statement in what that, in, in that the statement omits any concern about unions under control of fascists or military dictatorships. It points left and not right. Although in many other pronouncements, AFIELD often said they were opposed to both left and right. That's what makes the assassination of my brother at the Sheraton Hotel very peculiar. The conditions in El Salvador then were extremely turbulent. At the end of the 70s, with the agrarian land reform in full swing for over a decade, 2% of Salvadorians still continued to own 60% of the land, mostly large coffee and sugar plantations. The economy was in the hands of the landed oligarchs, known as the 14 families. 50% of the peasants tree owned no land at all. In 1975, a family of six needed $704 per year for basic needs, 80% earned less. Okay, go to the next slide, please. 
That one, yeah. In the 1930s, faced with this kind of exploitation, the peasant class led by the Communist Party rebelled against the landowning class. They were defeated. After their defeat, the ruling junta had 30,000 massacred. Fast forward in the early 70s, the popular movements were poised to win electoral victories, but had the election stolen from them. Mass resistance increased in popular organizations and trade unions with a guerrilla warfare in the countryside. In 1977, there was a US supported military coup, which unleashed horrific violence. By 1979, over 3,500 people were assassinated or illegally detained. During 1980, in the year before my brother was killed, an estimated 10 to 15,000 were killed, including 1,000 unionists. Between 79 and 83, 30,000 Salvadorians were killed, 5,000 of which were unionists. This includes the bombing of union halls. What's important to understand in all of this is that this carnage was also part of the Alliance for Progress. Afield's much touted land reform, led by Jose Rudolfo Vieira, the Campesino organization by fund, by funded by Afield, was just the carrot. The stick was the formation by fascist and right wing elements of a rural policing and military force that went by the acronym ORDEN a force of tens of thousands. Like the Campesino organization, it got its support from the US Agency of International, for International Development, the CIA, and the US State Department. Orden also had the support of the US Army, Army's Green Berets. Many of Orden's death squads were trained at the US School of the Americas in Fort Benning in Georgia. These two operations worked hand in hand, especially as matters grew increasingly desperate. A new and improved phase of land reform was announced on March 6th of 1980. The very next day, March 7th, the government declared a national state of siege. Three weeks in, my brother sent an internal memo to his boss, William Doherty, careful to conceal what was happening on the ground. He stated that the land reforms got off to a good start. Quote, there were no deaths whatsoever in the initial interventions and the army acted with strict striking self-restraint. Any violence by the junta and the army was in response to violence initiated by others. And then he goes on, it is the anti-democratic forces on the far right and far left who oppose the land reform that are almost entirely responsible for what limited violence has occurred, as if the junta and the army represented the democratic forces. Which brings me back to the January 3rd assassinations. The Sheraton Hotel was where Afield was headquartered. That's the hotel partly owned by some of the oligarchs. That's where the oligarchs were known to hang out. In fact, the night of the murders, the oligarchs, oligarchs were having a party right there in the ballroom. These were the same oligarchs who opposed all land reform and whose interests the junta and army were defending. The reactionaries had had enough of Yankee intervention. The Reagan administration was right around the corner, but we should be clear that Wright didn't ambush the AFIL operation in the dark or on an abandoned road like they murdered the four valiant marrying old nuns. They were killed right in their own lair. And the last photo is the movement keeps moving on. And that's a demonstration by the by the masses in, in El Salvador in 2018. And with that, I conclude what I have to say.